Yeah, amen. Isn't God good? Man, let's give God praise. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, that's a big deal. And uh, man, I'm so excited. And uh, it must, the Vikings must not be playing today. And uh, I'm just kidding. They are. And, uh, but I can't, I can't uh, chide them because the Bears are terrible too. So it's going to be a great year, I guess. <laughs> and uh, oh, well, hey, never hurts to never hurts to pray a lot, so I guess. Hey, if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Acts. We're in the Acts series, and uh, look at your neighbor and say, let's get this going. And yeah, let's get it going. So uh, let's go ahead and pray real quick and ask the Lord to be with us today. So Father, we, uh, we pray that in just for the next few moments that you, you would help us to stay focused. I pray against distractions that would cause us uh, to have the seed put in us and something to, to take it away. I just pray that you would give us ears to hear, a heart to implement, and feet to carry it out. We thank you in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen. Uh, it was in November uh, 22nd in 1963 that one of the most horrific events happened in our nation. In fact, uh, our president had uh, little knowledge or no knowledge at all that that day would be the last day. And he's coming around in uh, 411 uh, Elm Place in Dallas, Texas, downtown. And nobody knew it, not the people that protected him. Uh, they didn't know it. In fact, we know that Lee Harvey Oswald was with a sniper rifle and would shoot three bullets that would take the life of our president. And after that, uh, it would cause one of the greatest agencies of protection in our country uh, the Secret Service to make some modifications to try to, to help this to never happen again. Well, 18 years later, we find uh, those changes are implemented. Uh, President Ronald Reagan comes out of the hotel in Washington, D.C., and a man by the name of John Hinckley Jr. made his way through the cr crowd and about 15 feet in front of the president fired six shots at close range. In fact, uh, he intended to kill our president. But what, what we find out and what we know is there all this chaos is happening. They shove him into the presidential limo, but one guy stands up. A secret agent by the name of Timothy McCarthy makes his body big and large to cover the president to absorb uh, the, the bullet. For, the fourth bullet actually shot him in the abdomen. Uh, in fact, uh, Secret Service uh, call that going big. 
And, and it's so interesting in our world how we will celebrate a president, which we should, uh, you know, that, that we celebrate JFK, we celebrate Ronald Reagan, but often we forget about the Tim McCarthy's. And I want to talk about today that, that I want to give press to the unsung, barely inked, unnamed nobodies who just simply do what they do. People that, that you, you won't hear a lot about, there's not a lot of books written about them, there's not a lot of uh, pay, uh, press given to them, uh, it's really these unnoticed that really should be notable. You know, we think about, when we think about Charles Lindbergh, that's who we think about, the spirit of St. Louis on the plane across the Atlantic, which was a major accomplishment for humanity. Uh, but we don't talk about Claude. Claude. Anybody know who Claude is? Claude's this plane mechanic that made sure the, the, the plane was in working condition so that he could do what he gets famed to do. Everybody wants to talk about Charles Lindbergh, but nobody knows about Claude. What about Martin Luther, the great reformer who nailed the 95 theses on the door of Wittenberg, Germany, and, uh, and he is notable for that, but nobody talks about Philip, Philip Melanthon, who is the translator that helped him understand what he was to read so that he could reform and God could use him. Everybody wants to talk about Martin, but little press is given to Philip. Or what about Billy Graham, the great and mighty preacher that thousands and millions of people perhaps have came to Christ because of his work. The guy at the front preaching, the, the altar call, just as I am. I mean, tremendous stadiums moving to receive Christ. But nobody talks about Grady Wilson. Grady was his buddy that in dark moments of Billy Graham's ministry, Grady would speak life to Billy Graham. In fact, Billy Graham was Billy Graham for a lot of reasons, but Billy Graham was Billy Graham because a lot of Grady Wilson's words of encouragement that changed his life. Everybody wants to talk about the guy up front, but I want to give some press to the guy in back. So if you have your Bibles, Acts chapter 11, uh, the church, and here's kind of my, my a big thesis today that I want to give, is not going to advance just with Christians with fame, but with regular everyday believers. We've been in a series going through Acts. This is our fourth stint this year in Acts. Really excited about our next series called Healed. We believe that God's going to heal people uh, in November. And, and I've been, but I have been enjoying going through Acts. It's caused me to dig. It's caused me to see things in the book of Acts that I really have never discovered before. And we come to uh, Acts chapter 11. And the first uh, several verses is a retelling of Cornelius. And I'm kind of like, why, why is that? And I think a lot of the reason why is because God wants us to know that nobody is beyond the reach of God. Once again, it shows us the power of the gospel. And maybe you're here today and you think that what you've done is, is impossible. Maybe that the church should collapse or maybe you've done something that God could never forgive. I want to encourage you that God's arm is never too sure, nor is his ear deaf, that he loves you, he cares about you, and that the gospel is for you. So in Acts chapter 10 and then in Acts chapter 11, we see with Cornelius, the first, I think, 18 verses, we see the, the first Gentile believers. Then we come to Acts chapter 11, verse 19, and, and we, we're going to begin to see the first Gentile church. Let's look at it. Uh, but I love this exclamation point as it rolls into 18. It says, when they heard this, they had no further objections and praise God. So then, even to Gentiles, that's you and I. Unless you're a Jew, it's, you're a Gentile, uh, that, that even to the Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Aren't you glad that, that the gospel is for everyone, not just Jewish people? God used the Jews to help bring the gospel to the world. And so we're so thankful that Acts 10 happened, and because Acts 10 happened, we're here today. So let's look at verse 19. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution, everybody say persecution, that broke out when Stephen was killed, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, and spreading the word only among Jews. This church in Antioch comes from the stoning of Stephen. All through the New Testament, we see that the gospel spread not in spite of suffering, but because of suffering. 
In fact, I really enjoy that what the enemy has meant for evil, God can make it into good. And I want to encourage you today, what the devil has tried to kill in your life can serve to advance your life. I am so glad that God takes the negative and spins it for his glory. So what we see is that Satan's strategy to stop the church will ultimately serve to spread the church. So we see the persecution's a big deal. And it caused people to go with the gospel in places that it wouldn't have gone except by persecution. So let's look at verse 20. And I want you to note this. Some of them. Everybody say some of them. However, men from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch. You could circle that and begin to speak to the Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So Acts chapter 11 is a reference to what happened with Stephen in Acts chapter 8. Look at it. Uh, So on on that day, a great persecution broke out, verse 1, against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. All except the apostles. Acts chapter 11, some of them. Acts chapter 8, all except the apostles. So I want you to look at this, that... Some people that were unnamed, unnoticed, that were not Philip or or the big dogs of, of the apostleship of Philip and James or Peter and John, that some of these unnamed people were faithful with the small that they had and they brought the gospel to Antioch. And it became one of the the greatest historical churches in the history of Christianity. Just some. In fact, what's interesting is all except the apostles, the big dogs got left behind and God used the little dogs to advance the kingdom of God. Isn't that awesome? Some of them, all except the apostles, man. No training, no pastor certificate, no leadership books, no backing of a denomination, just some sums start one of the greatest churches in the history of Christianity. Uh, there, there's uh, These Psalms in Acts 11 are so opposite of what we see in the parable of the talents. Remember the parable of the talents? That God kind of depicts himself as the, these, the giver of, of talents and the giver of gifts and the giver of things that what you and I have, God has given to us. And he he compares and throws believers into a few categories. The first is that God uh, gave uh, the five talents to one person. And and they did something with it. That God gave uh, the second person two talents and they did something with it. And then we see that God gave one talent to a person and they buried it. And, And it's so opposite of what we see in Acts chapter 11 According to the parable, the problem wasn't with the first or second category, but actually with the third. And, and I'm looking at this, and this, this really jacked me up this week. I mean, like, jacked me up. Like, I got so excited, I, I, I became oh, I, just unbelievable. It was just, it, it, I'm, I'm, that's what I am right now. Because <laughs> there was no problem with those who had received five talents or those who had received two, but the problem was with the one talent. The five talent represents the the more visual believers with the the more gifts and the the more notoriety. Uh, But why did the one talent person bury it? Because that one person considered that what they had was so little. In fact, uh, they, they consider that their function, their service, and their work mean nothing. Because they do not have a large portion or an amount, uh, uh, in five or, or even two talents, they tend to, to let the more gifted ones replace them in their function. So my point is today is if you feel like that you're a one talent person, if you look across the landscape of the church and you're like, man, I'm not the singer, I'm not the preacher, I don't have this incredible leadership gift, I want to encourage you that God still uses people with one talent. Don't you dare back up, don't you dare bury it, don't you dare give it away because you are significant in the life of the church. Don't you underestimate what God has put in you for his glory. And I love what Watchman Nee says. He says, the church is not suffering 
so much from the prominence of the five talent members as from holding the holding back of the one talent members. The life of the whole body is hampered and impoverished by the burial of those single talents. What he is saying is, is that the church could be so much farther in its reach, so much farther in its potency, so much farther in its effectiveness if the people that felt insignificant would just take what God has given them and use it and offer it to their world. And he's saying now tragedy strikes that they bury their talent and now the church is hamstringed when it shouldn't be. So if you're here and you're thinking, man, I'm not that talented, I'm not that gifted, this is for you today. But I also think the bigger tragedy is people who are uber talented, but bury it anyway too. So I don't know who this is for today, if it's the five talent person who's burying it, which is a great tragedy, or the one that's burying it. Nonetheless, it's the sums that did something significant. So I want to talk to the sums today. I want to be a sum. How about you? I don't care what God has given me. I want to be faithful with what God has given me. So historically, ordinary believers have been the tip of the gospel spear. In fact, uh, there's a book written by Stephen Neal about the history of Christian missions. And he points out what is more remarkable than the speed of the gospel spreading in the early church was what was more remarkable was the anonymity. The the fact that, that there was... Uh, anonymity in in the church and he said that in the first century you had three churches that that were major Antioch uh, Alexandria not Minnesota by the way Uh, that's that's uh, another Alexandria and then then of course Rome and what is amazing uh, amazing is that we have no idea who started them like these 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 incredible churches like these these five talent type level churches and, and, we're, and everybody in history is wondering who's responsible for them. Isn't it human nature to want to find out the, the, the blessing of, of why? But God allows their anonymity to stand because I think God wants us to understand that if we're going to build the church, it's not going to come through the fame of a celebrity Christian. It's going to come through the regular faithfulness of people that are everyday believers. And so I want to challenge you today to know who you are. I love that. So uh, Antioch, Acts chapter 11, all we're we're given about that church is some of them. Uh, In fact, in Rome, uh, Paul's trying to get to Rome. Like he's trying. Shipwrecked, snake bites, gets beat a lot. He talks all about it. Finally, he comes sliding into Rome, tethered and torn. And he finds that in Acts chapter 28, he's greeted by the brothers. By the brothers. Like, who the brothers? We don't know who the brothers are. The brothers is all we get, unnamed people that already started what Paul dreamed of. Paul shows up wanting to do something significant to find out a few brothers came and just did in the quietness of faithfulness what he dreamed to do. So he just sh- so he shows up. He's like, well, what, what's, what am I going to do? You can just write a book, Paul. Just write, write a book. And he writes Romans. So... It's pretty awesome. And then we have Alexandria, which is not given a lot of press at all in the Bible, but, it's, but we feel its significance historically because it's in the quietness of, of, of faithfulness where some or some brothers or some sisters or some one talent people decide to do opposite of the talents, the parable of the talents, and just simply do what God has called them to do. So according to, to Jesus, the greatest preacher to ever live, Remember, it, it rhymes with on the, the, uh, on the Baptist. That's what it rhymes with. Who the great, who's the greatest preacher that Jesus says? John the Baptist, right? John, Jesus loved John. He's, like, he's on his podcast, Instagram. He, he, he had a poster of him in his bedroom. Uh, and, and here's what Matthew 11, 11 says. He says, this is Jesus talking. I tell you the truth. Of all who have ever lived, no one is greater than John the Baptist. Thank you, Jesus. But then listen to what else he, what else he says. Yet even... The least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. The least, which is you and I, is the greatest. So if you're here today and you're like, man, I just got one talent. I got the one with the least talent, the one with the least skills, the one with the least Bible knowledge, the one with the least charisma, the one that's always picked last, the one that has the worst personality, the one that nobody else gets excited about. God says that you are the greatest. 
That's what God says about you, right? And so I'm looking at that, I'm thinking, man, that's tremendous because we have something that John the Baptist didn't have. We have, we have uh, first of all, resurrection, but then we also have the Holy Spirit empowered inside of us, living, knocking on our door, causing us to spread the gospel in an effective way. So how, how let, me, let, me, let me just say this, I want to focus on the sums today, uh, just for a few moments, including Barnabas, because... Um, uh, the Psalms did uh, make their lives felt in Acts chapter 11, building the church in Antioch. So Barnabas uh, was not a part of the original 12, remember that, but he in Acts, uh, Acts 14 was called an apostle finally. And, and my thought is, to me, Barnabas was a, a Psalm at one point. He was what I would call, in regards to Psalms, he was the OG. Do you know what the OG is? Original gangster, right? He, point is, he was the original sum that because he was, he just used what God gave him, uh, then he became significant in, in the church. He wasn't always significant, but he became significant because that's what sums do. Sums are unnoticed, but they become effective because they just work the talent that God gives them. So here's the question, how to exist effectively in the church like the sums did in Antioch? So how, how do I invest myself in building the church that Jesus died for? It's a great question. So we're going to answer that. Number one, you guys ready? Yeah. A few people are. You guys ready? Yeah. yeah, all right. Pinch the person next to you or tell them to play Angry Birds. Let's go. Okay. You, you want people to sense you? Here we are. Psalms, hear the need and meet it. That's what Psalms do. Look at Acts chapter 11, verse 22. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. They asked Barnabas to go, and he went. There was no, I need to pray about it, let me fast about it, let me think about it. How many times do we pray and fast about something that God already told us to do, which is go, right? Over and over again, the reason Barnabas is called an encourager is less with his words and more with him meeting needs. Because when it comes to encouragement, we always think of like speaking up to people, speaking, building people up with our words, but it's more than that. In fact, Acts chapter 11, we see that Barnabas, when he first comes on the scene, that he sells a piece of land and the church needs some finances and he gives it to the church. So right away, we see that Barnabas is meeting needs by finances. In Acts chapter 9, we see that a guy that, that's no different than Osama bin Laden comes to know Christ. And everybody's like, he's still crazy. He's going to kill us. He's going to persecute us. Nobody trusted him. But it was Barnabas that stood up for him heard his story and said, the change that you see is real in his life. And so now Barnabas is meeting needs by friendship. Acts chapter 11, we see it in Antioch. Here he is again, and, and they're sending him because he's good at meeting needs. And now he, he's helping with this newly emerging church, and he's meeting needs by following up, by faithfulness. And so as you and I begin to make a difference, as if we're going to make our presence felt in the places that we live, in the, in the neighborhoods that God puts us, then we're going to have to see the needs and meet the needs. And I would tell you that if the Holy Spirit truly is inside of you, then that becomes a barometer to where you are with him. Because it's, it's, it's an impossibility for the Holy Spirit to reside and for you to be growing in him and not have a greater sending capacity. And not have ability where, where you, you, you uh, say no to the needs that are presented. Because God is faithful that he puts the Holy Spirit in us. Because the Holy Spirit's always wanting to do something. That's his nature. He's always wanting us to meet the needs. And so I look at that and I'm like, Lord, I noticed in my life, the, the, less the, the more apprehension I have of meeting needs, the more distant I am with you. So now, all of a sudden, meeting needs is more about, is also a, an engagement for me to measure where my heart is with him. So I, that's the truth, and, and because I know that if I'm faithful with him, I'll have more yielding to what he presents to me. Here, here's what one guy said this, folks have a hard time obeying Jesus because they have a hard time taking orders from a stranger. So I, I like this, because when you talk about meeting needs, that's what sums do. They, they make their presence effective by their behavior and by what they do in the place that God puts them. But I also love what Barnabas didn't do. See, Barnabas went and he met somebody else's need. He didn't evaluate his church attendance based upon how the church could meet his needs. 
Because, you know, I, I think sometimes we get so fixated on, oh, I want to go to a church that meets my needs, and, and I have needs, and, and, and my family has needs, and, and I have needs, and my family has needs, and I got to have a place that meets my needs. I, I you, know what, you know who sits in the eye chair? Babies sit in the eye chair. And, and what, what if God put, uh, put a need around you to, to, to not focus on your need But when you begin to minister to somebody else's need, it's the way the kingdom works. And when you focus on somebody else's need, somehow God begins to to minister to your need. But if you're so fixated on your need, God can't meet your your need because his design for you is to meet somebody else's need. And in part, he'll begin to worry about and minister to your need. Yeah, I love that, right? Well, I got needs. Well, if you have needs, then the best thing to do is to focus on somebody else's needs, right? Number two, everybody say two. You want people to know that you're there. Some give grace in imperfection. So Acts chapter 11, verse 23, when he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done. I mean, there's, that's, that, well, let's just go home. I mean, mic drop. I mean, that's, let, let's go watch the Vikings. Let's get the popcorn out. Get the band back out. Let's go. Because I'm looking at that and I'm like, man, grace does more than judgment. Grace does more than you and I thinking that God, a spiritual gift of condemnation, is like in the actual book where you think people tend to think that it's my job to go down the the field blowing the whistle at everything that people are doing wrong. That's not a spiritual gift. But, but what's more important is the grace in the midst of this, the grace that's given. And you can do more with grace than you can judgment. You can do more with loving people and kindness than you can about always whistling shortcomings. You, you know, that's just power, the grace of God. You know, and I look at just this, this environment that God's doing stuff in Antioch. I mean, it, they're new believers. Antioch was like Las Vegas, Sin City. And here God is delivering people. And I'm going to tell you, when you're a new believer, that doesn't make the baggage go away. So there's a major need for grace. And I'll tell you this, that, you know, I think about grace in the middle of imperfection. There's no perfect church because there's no perfect people. Right? And so if you're looking for the perfect church, this is not it. I mean, two weeks ago, I come out with my fly unzipped. Hi, y'all. What's up? <laughs> Seriously, you can get it online. I mean, it's, it's like one of our most viewed. It's like, let's get online to see the pastor with a zipper down. <laughs> Welcome to church. <laughs> I mean, I was like so embarrassed. I went home and I wanted to take my tractor drive off the cliff. This is not the perfect church, right? I'm not the perfect pastor. Uh, we, things happen, right? We're the seventh grader with the beard. I mean, you know, it's just, we're awkward. We're not perfect. We don't, we, there's just stuff that, that we're not great at, but there's a lot of good things that we're good at, right? So, <laughs> yeah. So, if you, here's the deal. If you find the perfect church, don't join because you'll ruin it, Right? Grace in the middle of imperfection. I love that. Um, you know, one of my, uh, my life coach, many of you know I have a life coach, had him for five years. He's wonderful. He calls me off the ledge. And he says, you know, in our conversation, there's a lot of times he said, you know, uh, if, a, if a person can get about 75% uh, with the local church, that's incredible. Like 75% I like about this church. That means 25% eh, I don't really care about. And I really love that because it sets me free because we have the tendency to think, uh, that we can actually find the perfect church. Where it's like 100% that I agree with, 100% I like, well, I don't like. The, 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 really, the truth is, if you can f- find 75%, uh, that, that's, that's an A, because there's no perfect church, because there's no perfect people. So, so you know, I, I like to think this. He said this to me. He says, you know, he perfect died in the garden. There's no such thing as perfect anymore. So quit trying to chase perfect because it doesn't exist. That's why Jesus had to come to restore what is imperfect back to perfect. So uh, what do you look at when you see the church? Well, I see messes. You know what? You need to maybe see what God is doing. Well, I, I choose to have an attitude of what God is doing, not an attitude that's focused on what he's not doing. That, that's what we do. We, we, we choose. You know, it takes no divine insight, no prophetic gift at all to find the cow patties in the pasture of the church. Zero, right? So uh, I love this quote. To be a critic, you have to have 3% education, 
5% intelligence, 2% style, and 90% goal. It's true. Anybody can be a critic, right? Yeah. It doesn't take faith to look and see in the midst of problems what's going on and point out problems. It's actually pointing out what God is doing. That's what, that's what it takes. So, so let's look at number three. Here we go. Uh, t- to build what Jesus died for, sums are attractive and possess the right attributes. Look at this. Uh, this is talking specifically about the OG Barnabas, but look at what, what they characterized him as. He was glad, encouraged them to all remain true to the Lord with their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. The way that you influence people depends on the attributes you possess. You know, I think about how, uh, you, you know, when, when I first came to this church, no offense, but uh, there were people that didn't shake my hand. They didn't like the guy, the kid, young kid, 33 years old, with the mohawk. I had a couple guys sitting over here, and, and, and he, I offered him my hand. He wouldn't even shake it. How, how do you make a difference in the world when you can't even shake your pastor's hand? I mean, are you even saved? I mean, look at it. You read 1 John. You can't say that you love God and, and hate your brother. The love of God is not in you. So, so I'm looking at this, and, 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 and I love the, the attributes, that, that you are what you attract. Look at the attributes. He's good. He's glad. He's full of faith. He's full of the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, man, that's the type of things that's going to get stuff done in the church. You know, the, the lady that's mean and grumpy that won't shake your hand in the church, and her name is Grace, she's not doing anything. But Barnabas is so different than that. See, people want to be in a place where they're encouraged. People, people want that. They, they want to be, uh, they, want, uh, they, they want to see gladness. They want to know that, man, when they come to church, that their world is going to be better, their lives are going to be better than when they didn't come to church. You know, they can go to the American Legion and meet grumpy people, but, man, the church should be a place where there's gladness, there's joy, there's health, there's hope, there's anointing. Come on, that's where the church should be, right? You know, I wrote this down. A pat on the back, though it's a few vertebrae removed from the kick in the pants, is miles ahead in results. Right? We, we, need, a, we need more pats on the back and less kicks in the pants. Amen. Number four. All right. You want people to know you're present and alive? Here it is. Sums engage with an unwavering commitment. So Bar- here it is, verse 25. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, uh, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, everybody say a year. year. Barnabas and Saul met with the church and great number of people, great numbers of people, taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called, first called Christians, first at Antioch. Look at this. Barnabas commits, Saul commits, and the people commit. Nothing gets done when the commitment is a week long. I'll, I'll tell you this, nothing gets done when it's all about inspiration and not about perspiration. See, see, I, I get weary of a church that has, to have, uh, that has to have a pep talk from the Dr. Phil and have to have the right worship band to get the right emotion so they can be obedient to what God has put in them. I'm asking for a God, raise in me a commitment that it doesn't matter how I feel. It doesn't matter if the emotion is present or not. I'm going to be committed to doing what you called me to do. Right? I'm just not going to be, I'm not going to be feeling centered. Because frankly, the, even there, there are moments and days I don't want to go to church. I don't want to make the right choice. I don't want to read the word. But it's not about what I feel. It's about the commitments that I keep. Right? It's the truth. You mean to tell me you don't want to read the Bible, Pastor? Yes, that's what I'm saying. But you know what? My dad told me when I was a little boy, he says, you got to do things you don't want to do to get what other people don't have. And so I want, you know, look at the world that doesn't commit. You want what they got. Here's what I want. A solid marriage, great finances, and I want my life to be salt to the world around me. I don't want what everybody else wants. So, you know, it's interesting because the, the, the church here is, is the, the word Christian comes up for the first time. Little Christ is really what the word is interpreted to be. You know, it's, it's, I think about it, my, my, one of my boys really looks like me and acts like me. It's kind of scary to see that, right? 
I'm like, man, don't do that. Then I'm like, that, that's me. <laughs> and he, he could be called Heath Jr., right? I mean, and, and that's exactly what's taking place, that these people, because of commitment, people are called Christians. Listen, if we're going to raise up people, you talk about discipleship, I love discipleship, but discipleship has a commitment level attached to it that when you're committed, not just a month, not just two months, but you're committed year in and year out and you sow into the field that God puts you, that's when people start looking like Jesus. That's it. You can't do anything great in a day. Barely. Okay. So here we are. Barnabas was planted in Jerusalem, sent by a place where he was planted and then once again planted himself in the Antioch church. Look at, I'm saying that planted word for a reason. Psalm 1-3, look at it. They, that, that's those that are blessed. Psalm 1 talks about how to be blessed. Uh, are like trees planted along the riverbank. Look at this, bearing fruit. Say bearing fruit. Bearing fruit. Each season. Uh, you don't have to say that. Their leaves never wither. Say never wither. And they prosper. Say prosper. In all they do. It's awesome. And, and I want to tell you, if you want to have the attributes of never withering, you want to have a life that prospers, and you want to bear fruit as a Christian, it's going to come because you've planted yourself in commitment along the stream and the riverbank. And so I, I, it's, it's hard to grow a life that bears fruit and that doesn't wither and prospers without being planted. Why don't people plant roots? I think one of the reasons is, is because consumerism in the church. Here's what one guy quoted. He says this. He says, we treat church with a consumer mentality, looking for the best product for the price of our Sunday morning. As a result, we're fickle and not invested for the long term, like a lover with a wandering eye, always on the hunt for something better. So, so part of the reason why the, the church is in the shape it's in is because people treat the church like it's a business. And I understand that there's some business attributes and there, there's some systems that need to happen. I get that. But at the end of the day, it's not like going to Wendy's because you like the burger, going to Burger King because you like the fries, and then going to uh, uh, McDonald's because you like the Coke. That's a consumer. Well, Heath, I, I like the worship at the Baptist church and I like the kids at the E-Free church, but I like the preaching at, 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 the, at the church down the road. Listen, this is not a consumeristic idea. It's where we put ourselves second and him first. It's where we decrease so he increases. We plant ourselves. This is not, a, this is not some like McDonald's where you can create what you want. That's not the deal. So it's planting ourselves. It's, it's, it, it is. It's, it's incredible. So what would it be like, though? Let me just ask you this. If you just gave your, the Lord a year of your life. It says they gave the Lord a year in, in Antioch, Paul and Barnabas. A whole year. Particularly with areas that you are not surrendered in. Like, what would it be like if you said, God, I'll give you a uh, Bible reading. And I'll, and I'll actually read through the New Testament. Which is awesome, because you can get a QR code. We're doing these, like, 30 days, uh, like... 30 day shred, 90 year. If you're like, man, I haven't even started, that's fine. Because you can go right on our site and you can get 30 days and 90 days and get through the New Testament. But maybe it's like, man, committing, not committing for a week or when you feel like it or when the emotions are high, but actually following through with your commitment. What would it be like if you gave your schedule to God for a year and said yes? What would it be like if you, if you committed to being in a group? What would it be like if you just showed up to church consistently? And showed up and attended. That's the question. What would it be like, God, if I gave you a year of my life? Here's the last one. Are you ready for this? Uh, you want to build the church Jesus died for? Sums live generously and give. Look at this. Uh, it's, it's 27 through 30. During this time, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus. I love that name. If I ever get a dog again, I'm naming him Agabus. It's just so cool. Stood up and through the spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire uh, Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. They're just generous. What a great opportunity to give a pep talk on giving. Uh, I'm not going to do that. You know why? I'm going to brag on you. You are an incredible, generous church. In fact, Pastor Brian said this last week, that, that you guys gave 70000 we gave $70,000 to the chair project. That's incredible. Give yourselves a hand. I want to affirm you. It's a big deal. 
And, and, and I mean, some of you are like, oh, I'm not generous. Well, get on the train. There's people up and down these aisles that are faithful in their giving, that they know that all they have belongs to God. They give the first and the best to God, not leftovers. They give the best they can to God. And because of that, they're making their presence known, and we're able to do what thi- what things that God puts in our heart as a church and to be able to attack the city for the cause of Christ so people come to know the Lord. I mean, you want to make yourself known, be a person that's generous. See, what you get is how you make a life. What you give is how you live your life. And I wish that some of uh, those in the room that are not generous would get this in your soul about what it's like to really live in the power of generosity, right? You know, I love that it says, as each is able. Uh, You know, and, and you can't give what I can give, I can't give what you can give, but all of us are called to be generous. You know, you think about how Jesus was God's tithe. I mean, you talk about God who gave. For God so loved the world that he gave. Jesus is the first fruits. We don't serve a God who, who said one thing and did the other. We serve a God who demonstrated his love for us while we were at Sinners Christ died for us. He demonstrates it all. And I'm gonna, if I want to be like God, then a part of that transformation of my life happens with the generosity that I have. It's just awesome. These guys were generous. Psalms, those who sit in obscurity and can underestimate their significance but don't. Those who could bury, but don't. Some of them. And it says the Lord's hand was with them. You start doing what God has placed inside of you to do, even though you feel like it's insignificant, even though you may feel like a one talented believer, uh, the the Bible says that the Lord will be with you. And then look at what else it says. Uh, People believed and turned to the Lord. You, You have a whole harvest that God has you to influence by that maybe small, insignificant gift that you think is insignificant. It's just tremendous stuff, right? So what could you be bearing that's not allowing your presence to be made known? You you know, the obituary is full of people that died and nobody knows it. There's all kinds of organizations out there that people leave and the organization doesn't feel it. I've kind of determined in my mind that when God calls me home, I want to be missed. I don't want to live life and nobody know when I'm gone. Whether it's my marriage, I don't want my wife looking across the empty bed and not feeling my presence when I was alive. I don't want my children to just go on with life like I was there, but I really wasn't there, and I made no effective result on them. I don't want the church, I don't want the community to have me gone and somehow not be missed. There was a guy that in a large organization, he was sleeping the, sweeping the floor one night. And uh, he, I'm, I'm serious, he found a little bottle that had a genie in it, and the genie popped out and said, I'll give you three wishes. Really happened. <laughs> First wish, he says, you know what? He was tired of sweeping the floor, and he said, I, I, I wish that I would be more important in this organization. Somebody that people would call, sir, poof, there he was, middle management. In the middle of a cubicle, the biggest cubicle out of all the cubicles. And he's like, man, this is, this is just absolutely incredible. He says, you know what? I want something more. I want to make some great decisions in this organization. On my second wish, I want to be more important. Poof, there he was. Corner office, glass on two sides, overlooking the city, leather seat, big desk, nice couch, big salary. He's like, now this is it. And then he says, you know what, on the third wish, Jeannie, he says, I want to be the greatest. Poof. There he was, back in the hallway, sweeping the floor. Yeah. And here's my point. 
I don't want you to feel like that you sweep on the floor. You're like, man, I don't have a talent. I can't sing. I can't preach. I'm insignificant. You need to understand that what God has put in your hand, wherever you are, you work what's in your hand and watch God do something incredible with it. Yeah. You need to write this scripture down, Ecclesiastes 9.10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Man, I don't care if you're a custodian in the middle of a large organization or you're the owner of an incredible company. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. I'm just a deacon. I'm just a small group leader. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. I'm just a single mom. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. I just have a little company. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Watch what God can do in your life. Would you grab your connect card? Would you do that? I'm going to ask our prayer team to come. Let's look at this. Number one, today I give my life to Jesus for the first time. Maybe you're here and you've never given your life to Christ. Man, do you understand what Jesus did for you? He died for you. It's incredible. Greatest gift you'll ever receive. Maybe you need to cross the line of faith today. Here's the second one. I want everybody to take a next step today. I desire to be a sum and live in a way the church feels that I'm here. I don't want to just go, go to church and, and, and not make a difference. I don't want to just be a part of heritage and, and not have my presence known and felt. Not that I'm looking for notoriety, but I believe that this one gift that God has put inside of me isn't meant to be buried but used. And I can do so much with one gift when God puts his hand on my life. So here it is. Number three is I'll finish strong in 2023 reading my Bible, the New Testament challenge. What would, what would it be like for a year? What would it be like for the next three months for you to just do what God has asked you to do? And the last one, number four, is I want to be water baptized on October 11th or 15th. And I will just tell you, I'm selfishly asking you because I want to dunk you for the glory of God. Yeah, so, man, powerful. Jesus did it for us as an example. And man, that's the right next thing to do if you know Christ and you've never been water baptized. Would you stand with me in this place? And um, man, take a next step today. Turn them in the Connect card. Uh, they're, they're gray in the foyer. You'll see them. They say Connect card. Take a next step today. Number two is that you can have some ministry today. These guys will pray for you and they'll minister to you. They'll believe God for you. Maybe you're struggling with your marriage. Maybe you're struggling with your finances. Uh, man, understand that, that, man, these guys want to intercede and believe with you for where you're at. Don't suffer in silence. Uh, and then the last thing is if you're new with us today I'd love to connect with you in the connect room and say hi uh, we're going to worship, the team's going to lead us and, and here's how we dismiss when God's dismissing you, you're free to go Okay, let me pray for you and let's, uh, let's worship and when, when God dismisses, you're free to go so Father help us to work what's in our hands with all our might <laughs>